I was asked by some of the students to give a little background, and I'll be real brief about it. Uh, I was born in the Bronx, New York. I walked to school to Fordham College. Ah, there's a Bronx site here. There always is a Bronx site. Um, and I majored in Russian at a time when it seemed bizarre to do so, but then Sputnik went up, then the Berlin Mobile all went up, and you know, all of a sudden there was great interest in people who could speak Russian, could teach Russian, who knew something about the Soviet Union. So after my uh, tour of duty as a U.S. Army officer, I went to the CIA and worked there for the 27 years. Uh, 27 years in the real CIA, okay? <laughs> now, uh, I guess maybe I'll just start off by observing that uh, often when I come to, to talk to a group like this, I'm, I'm in the back doing some last minute notes, and, and uh, about three times, uh, two gentlemen have come in and one, one has said, uh, that's him. You know? The other guy says, he don't look like a spy. <laughs> and I never know whether it'd be crestfallen, you know, or, or happy. Uh, but the teaching point here is that the people get their idea of the, C of the CIA from what? From the movies, from TV. And it's all about this second CIA that President Harry Truman never intended to create. It's an accident of history that the CIA would be involved in overthrowing government. Oh, sorry, we don't say that anymore. What do we say about overthrowing? What do we use? What, what phrase? Right, regime change. We don't overthrow governments. We just do regime change now. You know? We don't do enhanced interrogation techniques. We do EITs, EITs. You know? um, that's a sort of a dig digression here, but the point simply is that after World War II, when Truman wanted this one agency, uh, the director of which he could call up and say, look, you have two universities worth of specialists out there in the woods of Virginia. I want you and the best three you've got to come down and brief me at two o'clock this afternoon on a major policy issue that I have to give the uh, president advice on at seven this evening. Uh, an agency that had no access to grind, that was not subservient to the Pentagon, was not under the State Department, an agency that could tell it like it is. And why central? Because it would be a central place where, now the younger of you will have different problems with this, but we had inboxes made out of wood, actually. You know, back then. <laughs> no, really. Yeah. And into that inbox would come all manner of information, uh, very sophisticated, highly classified information, but most of it was press. And I'll betray a, 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 a trade secret here if you promise not to let it go out of this room. Okay. <laughs> and that is, uh, when I was working in this vineyard, about 80% of the information that you needed to adequately analyze a given situation, an issue, or a country was available in open media. Now, was it helpful to have a satellite photograph or an intercepted conversation? Yeah, sometimes that was really helpful, but almost always that simply, simply confirmed what you had already reasoned to by observing leadership statements, the press of other countries, and so forth. Now it's no longer the case. Now it's 90% that's available, okay? And it's available due to this wonderful thing we call the ether, the web, the internet. So um, just to, to close up this business about this other CIA, when the OSS, the forerunner of our spy agencies, came back from World War II, uh, they, they came back to well-deserved applause. Okay, these people, these men and women, were incredibly courageous, they were imaginative, they performed miracles behind the lines in Europe and in Asia. And they were expert at overthrowing governments, or paying off political parties, or whatever it took. And so they said, well, thanks for the applause, but uh, <laughs> should we stay around? You need us? Now, this is 1947, huh? Russians had already over, overtaken Eastern Europe, threatening Italy and France, uh, the Balkans, the KGB, the secret police running all over the, the world. And so the question answered itself, yes, we need you. Fair enough, okay. But then some idiot, <laughs> and I use the term advisedly, they said, hey, we're, we're creating this CIA for analysis. Tell the president what's going on. 
And some of that's going to be secret because they're going to have their own spies to collect information. So let's put, let's put all these covert operators, these overthrowers of government, let's put them in. Yeah, let's put them in with the analysts. So we had a structural fault from the very beginning. And Truman bemoaned this before he died. He said, I didn't intend to have a CIA agency that, that uh, overthrew governments and did all this kind of stuff overseas, assassinations and everything else. Uh, so uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, we had a fairly decent operation of telling the truth to power, telling it like it is to various presidents during the term I was working there for 27 years, almost up to the very end, okay? And we had nothing to do, we were hermetically sealed off with this, from this second CIA, which to my great regret ended up, well, kidnapping, torturing, building black prisons for eavesdropping, and doing all manner of things that violate our constitution, violate our laws, violate human decency, okay? So I wanna make clear that uh, it was in the former, it was in the CIA that uh, President Harry Truman intended that would be not only all the things I just mentioned, but when I say the inbox, we would have access to, theoretically at least, all the information available to the U.S. government on a given issue or subject or country. That's why Central, Central Intelligence Agency. The concept is great. I don't, uh, don't hold any brief for how it was corrupted. Now, there were things that I didn't learn in graduate study or even while working for the government. I only learned picking up the last sort of decade or 12 years or so uh, when I've been speaking about or out about our foreign policy. And one has to do with uh, what George Kennan. Now George Kennan was the ambassador to the Soviet Union, the author of The Containment. He, he's a really bright guy. And he used to be my idol, you know, ambassador to Russia. And he, he just was really top notch. But now I find out that after the war, when we became pretty much by accident, in my view, the sole remaining superpower in the world, okay? That's when it happened, guys. You know, Russia was destroyed. Everybody else significant was destroyed. We escaped most of that, okay? So we were in control of pretty much, well, you'll see. Here's, a, here's a, a statement that I dug out. The first policy planning um, document of the New Policy Planning Council in the State Department. Uh, it was written by George Kennan, who is the, the director of the Policy Planning Council, and it set our foreign policy at the end of the war. Um, you'll see that it, uh, it appears a, a little uh, bald-faced here, but I think you'll recognize it as setting the principles for our approach to the world after we became the sole remaining superpower in the world. Is it up there now? Great. Do we need to dim the lights or not? Okay. I'm not going to read it to you, but uh, there we go. What we have to do really is uh, we can't be we can't be sentimental about this or uh, or deceive ourselves that we can be altruistic. Um, vague, unreal objectives like human rights and the raising of living standards and democratization, you know, we're going to have to deal in straight power concepts by and by, and we ought to recognize that right off the bat. Wow. So that set the tone, folks. Now, we're no longer 50% of the uh, we now. Uh, anybody know? Maybe 40 or so. Uh, how about uh, percent of population? Anybody know? Five. Yeah, okay. So the disparity, the discontinuity, what Kennan calls uh, uh, the disparity that we need to maintain is pretty much in place, but we're no longer unchallenged and we're gonna have to change because this is not gonna work over the long term. I'll just show one more, one more slide on this. It's uh, Justice, uh, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis can everyone see that? So he's making a pretty important point here. That for good or ill, the government teaches by its example. Breeds contempt for law if it breaks laws. So 
to declare that government may commit crimes would bring terrible retribution. Now, that's a long time ago, uh, early 1900s. Um, now we don't worry about past crimes. Now we just look ahead. We don't look behind. You know, we want to start afresh. We, people torture or people lose. We don't worry about that. We just look ahead. Well, that's really the road toward, toward uh, chaos, in my view. I want to uh, just say a word about uh, what the result of Kennan's overarching principles were. Kennan was largely responsible for the fact that the covert operators got into the CIA that Truman intended, okay? He didn't intend that they'd get there, but they did. And so, uh, you know, in 1953, uh, when uh, this uh, person got elected freely in Iran named Mossadegh, uh, and he got this, you know, he had this weird idea that since uh, Iran was uh, pretty rich in oil, that maybe the Iranian people should share more in the profits of that oil. He didn't realize that that oil belonged to British Petroleum. Okay, he just didn't get it, you know. And so the British intelligence agencies took the fledgling CIA by the shoulder and said, now, now you guys are pretty young, but uh, let us show you what you do when some third world upstart tries to steal our oil. And you know the rest of the story? We overthrew that freely elected government in Iran, and that started our great relationship with the Iranian people. In, in came the Shah, whose secret police were second only to the Nazis Gestapo in the way they terrorized and the way they, 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 the way they tortured their people. So when, when Khomeini came in, he was viewed as uh, you know, a savior rather than the, the tough guy he turned out to be. Now, uh, I want to fast forward a little bit because uh, when you look at our policy, and I realize a lot of you younger people weren't around during 9-11, uh, you'll see that 9-11 gave uh, people who thought like George Kennan uh, an idea that they could pursue uh, our, great our great power chauvinism, as to what the Soviets would, would have called it, uh, to pretty, pretty ridiculous lengths. So I want to show you something. I want to get up a YouTube, uh, YouTube thing, if I may, that we haven't really rehearsed. Um, uh, people say, well, you know, how long did we know that, uh, quote, no, that uh, uh, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction? Well, uh, it turns out that we knew they didn't have weapons of mass destruction uh, right before we attacked them. Um, if you can just get, a, get the YouTube up. Okay, let me just give some context. Uh, I was going to show this as an example of, of the natural progression of U.S. policy designed to do the kinds of things that, that uh, Kennan advocated and that Brandeis warned against, how it played out with respect to Iraq. I was going to show you that Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice said before the attack on Iraq, that Saddam Hussein has no weapons of mass destruction. We've been able to keep them from him. He's not even a threat to his immediate neighbors. He has not developed any significant capability with respect to weapons of mass destruction. He is unable to project conventional power against his neighbors. And this is Condoleezza Rice, Bush's national security advisor, in July of the same year, saying the same thing, putting the lie to their own propaganda. Uh, we are able to keep arms from him. His military forces have not been rebuilt. A reflection of a change. And that, many believe, was the truth, a truth that was covered up and conveniently forgotten. It's a, it's a pretty vivid one-minute spiel, but you don't really have to see it. I'll, I'll tell you that that happened. And then in Iraq, during the surge, you know, the celebrated surge that, that the government would, uh, would lead you to believe both you know, both the Bush government and the Obama government would lead you to believe was a great, great success. Uh, this is what happened during the surge, and it shows not only the brutalization of, these, of the Iraqis, but also of our own troops. You know about the WikiLeaks photography, probably. You probably don't know about this program. This is from a German 60 Minutes type program. Uh, it's, uh, the program is called Panorama. It's been around since shortly after World War II. It's the best the Germans have. They came in and did the kind of documentary that 60 Minutes should have done. No American media would touch it. 
Uh, they did a, a German version of this, 15 minutes. When I saw it, I said, we have to get that in, back into English. So I asked the Germans, would you please uh, undub it or redub it or <laughs> get it back into English, okay? And they said, no, we don't do that. But finally, they, they acquiesced when I told them there's nothing like this in the American media. So what you see here is a almost amateur version well, it's amateur in the sense that the person who interviewed us, a young woman who had uh, studied for her college degree at American University and has very good uh, American English, she narrated this in the English version. It's only about 10 minutes, and uh, I think that you'll get an idea of the direct result of the policies that I showed in that slide. You might want to dim the lights for this one, I don't know. If, if so, just go ahead. Minutes later, U.S. infantry soldier okay, Ethan great. McCord arrives at the scene. When I came up onto that scene, um, I remember thinking, you know, oh, well, it was this guy with the RPG or this guy with the AK-47 obviously did this to the van. Um, there's no way in hell that we, we would do this. This military video shocked the world when WikiLeaks released it almost a year ago. And this man is being blamed for legally downloading it from a secured army network. 23-year-old Bradley Manning, who has been held in solitary confinement for seven months. A small group of supporters is demanding his release, but their voices are drowned out by media that has largely presumed his guilt. I'm sorry, that's treason. So there's no gray area about it. And this is a capital offense. You capital can't have offense. You're saying the execution. You're saying execution. If, if, he, if, he is a, if he is convicted of treason, I absolutely would support uh, a capital punishment. Oh, shut down WikiLeaks. We've got a presidential order to shut that down. This guy should be tried, Manning should be tried for treason, executed if he's found guilty. Whoever in uh, our government leak that information is guilty of treason. And I think anything less than execution is too kind of penalty. The onboard camera of this attack helicopter is targeting a group of people in a neighborhood in Baghdad. Among them are two journalists from a news agency, Reuters. The photographer, Nami Eldon and his assistant, Said Hamiga. The men can neither see nor hear the helicopter that is stalking them. It is too far away. The pilots mistake Nor Eldon's camera for a weapon. And attack them. Scenes that resemble a video game, but what you see here is real. Real people. The pilots are laughing, making macabre jokes. The Apache gunner is still targeting the heavily wounded Reuters employee Saad Hamiga. He will not survive. Later, the Pentagon investigates the incident and concludes the chopper pilots had done nothing wrong. The attack was part of a combat operation. It was justified because earlier American soldiers had come under fire by insurgents. The Pentagon has denied our request for an interview. However, one individual has been punished, Bradley Manning, in jail accused of leaking the video. The charges, downloading and disseminating classified information. His roots lie in Europe. As a teenager, he moved to Great Britain to the small town Haver, Fort West. His mother is British, his father American. Here he attended school for four years and graduated with Tom Dyer. He was one of Manning's closest friends. To Dyer, it is no surprise that Manning might have released a video. He remembers his friend as a great idealist, even when he was still a teenager. He had a great moral compass. He, he knew in himself what was wrong and what was right, and he didn't like the thought of people abusing their status and making other people feel small and doing things that were wrong. It was precisely for this reason that Manning joined the army. He said he wanted to fight for the good, but during the Iraq war he apparently started to have doubts. 
As an intelligence analyst, he had access to secret military files, including the video with the disturbing scenes. The video shows how Reuters employee Saad Ramega is struggling for his life. He survived the first shots fired from the attack helicopter. The pilots are still keeping track of him. Meanwhile, Salim Atasha Tumal and his two small children, Sayad and Duaha, are on their way to school. From his van, he sees the wounded Reuters employee lying on the curb. Tumal stops the car, gets out to help him. His two little children remain in the front of the van. The pilots request permission to shoot, again and again. The father is unaware of all of this. He does not even notice the helicopter above him. Tomala wants to rush the wounded Reuters employee to a hospital. His compassion will seal his fate. Even when the soldiers realize that they have shot children, they only hesitate for a moment, then make cynical remarks from the air. <laughs> Since that day, U.S. Army soldier Ethan McCord has been heavily traumatized. He still cannot get the images out of his head. As an Army infantryman, he was one of the first soldiers on the scene. When he arrives at the van, he hears the five-year-old girl scream. So I grabbed the girl and I took her into uh, the house um, behind the van um, with a medic and we were cleaning her up and what I did is um, <coughs> I took my gloves off and, and was pulling glass out of her eyes so that she can blink without cutting her eyes. Then McCord runs back to the van to check on the boy. The child is still alive, but badly injured. He carries the boy back to the medics as well. As his superiors observe this, they vehemently order him to stop saving the children. Instead, he should do his job and secure the area they command. Another thing that bothered me was the fact that uh, I was the only one to care enough, it seemed, for the children to try to ensure that they get medical attention. Former Army officer Ray McGovern is shocked by the actions of the pilots. He had been a CIA analyst for 27 years and an advisor to seven presidents, including George Bush Sr. How could anyone justify shooting up that man, shooting up the person who was crawling onto the curb? These are war crimes, pure and simple. When I learned to be a soldier and officer in the U.S. Army, I learned that you don't shoot at civilians, you certainly don't shoot people trying to rescue the wounded, and you don't blow up vans with a couple of children. In the Pentagon investigation report, there's no mention of war crimes. The pilots had reacted adequately. Here's the government saying that we did no wrong, but yet they lied. <coughs> they covered up the story. They covered up everything. Um, uh, and then all of a sudden being like, okay, well, uh, Bradley Manning, uh, who released this video, um, he's the wrongdoer in this whole situation. Um, it's kind of like, well, we have to have a giddy pig, a fall guy. Meanwhile, Bradley Manning is isolated. His friend David House is one of the few supporting him, and besides his lawyer, the only person currently visiting Manning in prison. He's held uh, for 23 hours a day in solitary confinement in his cell. Uh, it still has no windows, and he's not allowed to go outside or see the outdoors. Uh, he's not allowed to exercise. Um, the one hour a day he's allowed of his cell, out of his cell, he's allowed to walk in chains in an empty room um, for an hour, and that was what the military calls exercise in this case. Former U.S. soldier Ethan McCourt finds this incomprehensible. He's pleased the video has been leaked so that the public can form its own opinion. I think that Bradley Manning is a hero. Um, I believe that this is a human being who is compassionate, who saw illegal activities be taking place on a video. Um, granted, it was a couple years later, but still wanted the world to see that 
uh, these actions are intolerable. And, um, you know, yeah, he's a hero for showing it. He, he's a hero for releasing it, if he released it. My view on Bradley Manning is that he's a very courageous young man who, with, with 22 years, did what I didn't have the guts to do during the Vietnam War. For seven years, Ethan McCord had fought proudly for his country. Today, he feels ashamed. I didn't pull the triggers that day. I didn't, um, I didn't shoot people. I didn't shoot those people on the ground. Um, but it's me being a part of the system that is doing that to the people of Iraq um, is disgusting and it hurts. And um, it, I was, uh, after that day, I was, it was really hard for me to justify being in Iraq and being a soldier. And uh, I would never be a soldier again um, for the American government. It's, it's too dirty. I'd like to suggest that we leave the lights off and just stop what we're doing, even what we're thinking, if that seems appropriate. And take a whole minute, a whole minute just to be quiet. Reflect, if you will, on what you just saw. I've seen it a number of times, it's still very hard. Um, we probably know, all of us, that Bradley Manning has been held in confinement, eight months of which were solitary confinement, which the UN Rapporteur for Torture said was, if not torture, then certainly cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. That's what the Convention Against Torture says. Uh, that's what Ronald Reagan pushed for. That's what the first George Bush signed into law the UN Convention Against Torture. Uh, so, Bradley Manning, he's been over a thousand days, I think it's a thousand one hundred days uh, without trial. What about the right to a speedy trial? He's out of Quantico now, and I was in court when they played the, video, the uh, email exchange between the three-star uh, Marine General who was taking orders from the head of the Pentagon uh, telling them, give them the business, give them the business, forget what the psychologists, what the psychiatrists say, uh, they don't know anything, we can get them the business. Um, not only that, but some of you probably know, the President of the United States, the fellow's name is Obama, he was out in California about two years ago and he said, well, uh, well, Bradley Manning broke the law, so oh, hello. Obama is Bradley Manning's commander in chief. Talk about command influence? What's the lieutenant colonel woman lawyer who is trying Bradley Manning supposed to do now? Acquit him when her, when her ultimate boss has said he broke the law? So all kinds of incongruities, all kinds of indignities that have uh, uh, come in, into focus in this issue. Um, Mendez, the uh, UN rapporteur, he knows what torture is like. He's an Argentine, he's an Argentine, okay? He was tortured, he was in prison for a long period of time. He knows what solitary is like too. Now, one of the teaching points here that I would uh, kind of sort of emphasize is that it had to be a German panorama program to put this thing together, and no US media did it. And that sort of leads me to say what I always say in every lecture, and that is, well, I couldn't say it until last month, I'm 50 years in Washington, okay? Came down in 1963 when John Kennedy was president. A lot of us did. You know, a lot of us actually listened to John Kennedy's inaugural address and thought, you know, we got something to give to our country and we'll do it. There are some of them still alive, like me, okay? And uh, when we came down, we thought we, we could do something good and uh, the way things turned out, uh, things have gone pretty sour. The point is that uh, the biggest change that I've witnessed in these 50 years, and you see a lot of change in 50 years, uh, one that supersedes all the other changes is that we no longer have in any real sense a free media. I mean, that's big, folks. Thomas Jefferson, you know, who lived down where I live now in Virginia, he said if there's a choice between a government and a media, 
you pick the free media every time because governments will end up oppressing people if, if there's no free media to represent the people and keep them informed. So why did Bradley Manning do this? Precisely for that reason. He saw this, he saw on the spot, on the ground, young Iraqi students from the university, his age, 22, okay? He saw them wrapped up for writing a paper that was critical of the government and thrown into Iraqi prisons where he knew they would be tortured. He said to his command, he said, look, you know what's going on, we have to stop this. No, no, go home, shut up, complete your tour, and keep your mouth shut. So what I'd like to sort of segue into now is, uh, is what this means in terms of uh, our practice of torture. Uh, here we're tortured, we have tortured our own uh, army private, but as you all know, um, the lawyers uh, told uh, George Bush it was okay to torture people when he was asked about this, well, the lawyer said it was okay. And now we have the Constitution Project, uh, a bipartisan project that's been launched years ago and comes up with three key conclusions. Uh, U.S. government was guilty of court torture, um, that it didn't, uh, that it was authorized at the very highest level, namely George W. Bush and Dick Cheney, and that it didn't turn up any useful information that could not have been gathered in any other way. 